welcome. So just a quick welcome to the members. If you're not familiar with the network, we are part of a special interest group in the British Ecological Society. Um, we are aiming for ethnic uh, equality and diversity and inclusion. And essentially, we are aiming for anyone who is interested in ecology, conservation, um, environmental science, but mainly ecology. And you don't necessarily have to be an academic. You can be essentially an enthusiast, a volunteer, professional, anything. And we're essentially aiming to grow the network so that people can feel more like we belong in this space. Because as we know, the space is very thin for people from global majority backgrounds. So just a quick one to show who our committee is. So I am the chair. My name is Jordan. Nice to meet you. Um, our vice chair not here today. Uh, she couldn't make it, but it's Susmita. We have three of our... Uh, committee here today, so Fereza, who is the Memberships Officer, Sara, who is our Communications Officer, Justin, who is our Partnerships Officer, who will be leading the session today, and our Treasurer, Dr. Zabibu Kabalika. Um, I don't know if I'll pass it over to Justin in a little bit, and you'll get to speak to us <laughs> a little later when the session is open. Um, just a quick note before we do start, we will be at the BS annual meeting Jordan. this year in Liverpool. Mm -hmm. your, um, I don't know if it's just for me, but your slides haven't changed. I don't know. Really? Yeah. Hmm. Still on uh, slide one. Still? Okay, now they're changing. Yeah. Now they're changing. Oh, they're not. It's okay, also not. Cool. I'll just. I'll keep it off. I'll keep it off presenter mode because I was in presenter mode and it didn't change. I guess. Okay. But yeah, um, here are some names to faces if you didn't see those. There is uh, Sarah, Justin, <laughs> here today. Um, and then, yeah, just a quick note to say that we'll be at BES 2024 in Liverpool. So if you are planning to go, so the BES annual meeting is essentially the largest ecological conference um, in Europe, I think it is, um, ecological academic conference. We will be hosting a social and we do have a budget to do this. So if you are interested in going, you can reach out to us and see what the options are. If you're a member already of the British Ecological Society, we hope to see you there. But just drop any suggestions that you have in the chat for a social that you would like to do, because we do have some money to do something with members this year, um, which we haven't had in the past. So maybe something which would be quite fun. So have a think and drop us a message or you can send us a a DM on Instagram, or send us an email as well, which we'll give you a link to at the end of the meeting. And with that, I will hand over to Justin. Great, thanks for the introduction, Jordan. I'll just share my screen. Stop to. Can everyone see my screen? Yep. Yeah. Right. Yep. Cool. All right. Let me go into present the view. Can you see just my slides? No. Okay. Great. So hi everyone. Um. Thanks for taking some time out of your out of your lunchtime, presumably, to come and hear me talk about how you can make money to um to fund postgraduate studying so yeah this is our first lunchtime skills seminar um yeah thanks for all attending so i'm gonna i'm, I'm justin like uh jordan said i'm the partnerships officer with the reed network and i'm also a phd student based at the natural history museum in ucr let me just move this a little bit cool so presumably um I don't know all of your backgrounds, but um, some of you are interested in how you might be able to get funding um, for postgraduate studying. And I guess many of us, um, or just more more people in general, are studying for a master's, a PhD, a PGC, P, PGCE, um, or an MBA. And most of us are doing this to learn new skills, increase employability, or maybe start a new career. 
the issue that many of us face is how we pay for it. And as I'm sure many of us are aware, the average fees um, for a master's are around 12K and more than double that if you're an international student. There's also the cost of living crisis um, up and down the UK, which makes it um, increasingly difficult to study and also survive. Many of us know that scholarships are super competitive and they're pretty rare and hard to um, actually get places on. And even if you're willing to accept more debt to study, um, most of us will will struggle to, um, you know, not only is studying for a master's pretty difficult or any kind of postgraduate course, but if you don't have the finances to be able to do that, then it's going to be pretty hard, right? And so the alternative guide to postgraduate funding is um, a little bit unusual in that the main funding um, that you're seeking to target using this guide is um, charities, educational charities and trusts and um yep yeah, i've covered that point and so the funding um that you can obtain through the guide can be used for pretty much anything so you could use it for tuition fees um, maintenance research conference costs pretty much pretty much anything related to studying um many of these charities and trusts will fund it's applicable to all postgraduate students, regardless of uh, what subject or nationality uh, you come from. And most universities in the UK have subscribed for free. Um, otherwise, it's um, £14.99 for three months or £25 for the full year. And that will grant you access to the guide. And so... I'm just going to tell you a little bit about what the guide actually contains. So it's a database with over a thousand charities that make grants to students. And this database is constantly um, updated as more um, trusts and charities get um, found. It's a pretty unusual funding source in that most of these trusts and charities are obscure. They, they don't really have websites or um, you know they're not they're not really well known and they're also funded by old money but many of them will consider sponsoring you um regardless of your course your university your nationality or background and like i said whether you need the money for pretty much anything related to postgraduate funding so your tuition fees your maintenance um the cost of your research travel as well as conferences so having said that, charities require a unique approach, which is quite different to applying to kind of competitive research council funding. And so that's where the alternative guide comes in, because it gives you a step by step methodology um, for applying to, to charities and educational trusts specifically. So yeah, like I said, it's a methodology rather than simply a finding tool. So it, will, it makes the process as easy as it can be through lots of help, advice, templates, and things like that. And so the founders, the two um, people who set up the guide were actually PhD students themselves. And they won um, over, well, they won 55 charity awards between them. And so, it's a little bit unusual and unconventional, but if you're creative and you're determined, you can get lots of money. And yeah, so like I said, one of the founders um, fundraised pretty much his whole PhD um, and got around 40K through this method of applying to educational trusts and, ch and charities, which is, you know, it's quite impressive. So what's in the guide? There's the database, like I said, which has a list of all the charities and trusts. Uh, there's a personal statement uh, assistant, which allows you to organize all of your personal statements, which I'll go through in a, in a moment as to what you would need to include on those. But it allows you to organize all of them as well as it has a kind of um, like a chat GPT AI thing that can help you actually write them and tailor them to 
specific um, charities because that's what you want to do. You want to tailor your application based on the criteria and the eligibility for that specific charity. Um, there's lots of videos with Luke. This is Luke who raised over 40K for his own PhD, um, just kind of giving you tips and advice of how to um, apply in the best way. Um, and then there's a grant personal manage, um, a personal grants manager, which allows you to basically, because because there are so many, there are literally hundreds of charities, they just put in a manager which allows you to organize all of your grants. So you know, like when the deadline is, um, the priority, how much they're going to fund you, and you can put kind of comments so that you can just kind of keep track of um, the stages that you're at with the various grants that you and that you end up applying for. Okay, so um, that's kind of what's in the database, but I'm just going to talk through a kind of step by step of how you would actually go about applying. So you you you'd use the database to find the charities that you're eligible for. Then you'd contact and request the forms from the from the charity, and then you want to apply strongly and in the correct manner, and that's where the guide really helps. Well, the guide helps with all three steps. It has the database for finding the charities, the um, you contacting uh, contacting them. You have to do that yourself, but in terms of applying strongly and in the correct manner, the guide is really helpful for that. So the first thing that you will have to do for pretty much all of them, once you know you're eligible and that you can apply and you've contacted them and you've got the forms, then you have to write a personal statement. And so, like I said, this is arguably the most important part of your application. And you need to make your case convincing. You need to uh, convince the charity and trust that you're a deserving applicant. But the key difference Okay, I didn't I didn't put a, a point there, but the key difference as compared to conventional um, research council funding is that the charities and trusts will consider lots more different things. They won't just consider um, academic merit, they'll consider financial need. So are you in a situation that, um, you know, based on your background, your lived experience, what it, your personal experience, whatever it might be, that means that you really need this money and that you um you know you're gonna put it to good use with your studying based on your um you know what you've studied your experience your volunteering whatever it is that basically shows that your main um gap to studying is not having enough money but everything else is pretty solid so the guide will provide lots of templates and lots of um, techniques depending on what kind of student you are so are you a, um, a master's student are you a PhD student are you applying for this specific type, type of grant so there's lots of templates that can help you with that part of the application process but also lots of um, personal statements that have been used in the past by students that have worked for that specific charity so they provide all of that on the website as well, which is super helpful. Um, and like I said, there's the, the personal statement assistant, which will um, help you organize your personal statements, as well as um, a kind of chat GPT AI, which can help you write it itself and tailor it to that specific charity. And like, a, um, yeah, there's lots of um, examples of students that have used um, um examples of students that have used um, statements that have worked for specific charities as well. So as well as the personal statement, there's the financial statement. And so pretty much all charities will require a financial statement, which is something that probably many of us haven't done before. And the crucial difference, like I said, in the personal statement is that they care about your personal financial circumstances, not just about your academic merit and your research. So it's important to include that um, both in your personal statement and explicitly state it in your financial statement. Um, there's a financial statement assistant, which is similar to the personal statement assistant in that it will help you organize all of your financial statements for all of the grants that you end up applying for. 
And then here's just the kind of example of what that might look like. So you would have your expenses, so all of the things that um, you need to pay for in order to study, as well as your income. So what, you know, are you working? Where do you have other grants? Do you have savings? And then you would um, send that to the charity, your total expenses and your total income show that there is a deficit or a shortfall between those and then request um, a, a particular sum of money based on how much the charity or the educational trust award. So those are the two most important parts, the personal statement and the financial statement. Um, I'm going to move on to crowdfunding, which is another way of raising money. So um, this was pulled from the, um, the guide's website and talks about a student who raised nearly £14,000 through crowdfunding. So as well as applying for um, grants from educational trusts and charities, if you're crowdfunding alongside that, that looks really good. So you can say, you can show that you're um, being innovative, that you're exploring new methods in order to be able to study. And so the main things you want to think about when you're crowdfunding, so um, I didn't quite explain it. Crowdfunding is basically just being creative in how you can raise money from friends, from colleagues, from family members. So for example, I didn't crowdfund for my masters, but when I did self um, field work in South America, and in order to fund that, I um, ran a half marathon and just crowdfunded from all of my friends. So if you're able to do that for um, your masters, it looks really good if you're applying for grants alongside that. So you wanna be creative, you wanna be good at social media as well. You want to create a strong pitch of um, how this money is really going to benefit you and how it's going to, you know, unlock doors for you or give you certain skills um, and show that the main thing that you're missing is the money. Like you just can't afford to do this, but everything else is is pretty solid. And you want to also reward your pledges. So make sure that you find a way of basically just saying saying thank you to anyone who who um, um, donates to your um, crowdfunding. And there are lots of resources online. So the, the guide itself has um, lots of different stories of students who have crowdfunded lots of money. So if you're interested in crowdfunding, I would definitely check out that part of the, of the guide as well. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about how I use the guide um, to raise money for my master's. So after I finished my um, undergraduate degree in zoology, I knew I wanted to continue, continue studying. But um, as many of you know, there's no maintenance loan. So that stops at postgraduate level. And my tuition fees uh, were more than the maximum postgraduate loan that I could take out. I think my tuition was like 12 12 and a half, 13K, and the maximum um, loan at the time was like 10 point something. And so I found out about the guide. Um, I can't remember if it, if it was at university, but I came across it and decided to use it. I saw that lots of students had raised, raised lots of money through the guide, and I thought, why not give it a go? Um, so I ended up contacting around, I think, 50 charities. And in the end, I was only um, eligible for about around 12 of them. But um, in the end, I managed to raise around £4,000 from these charities. And it really didn't take me that long. It probably took me about, um, all in all, I probably worked over it over a summer, but it wasn't a tremendous amount of work. I follow, I, I used the database found the charities that I was eligible for, contacted them, and then used the database to apply strongly. Um, and I, all in all, it was probably around three months work. So it didn't take too much work and it just helped give me a little cushion to uh, pay for my tuition fees and then a little cushion for maintenance after that. And so I'm not I'm not the only one who's who's used the guide. Like there's been probably hundreds of students now that have used it and they've used it to fund pretty much anything related to postgraduate funding. So, 
you know, that these are all the student success stories on the website. And you can see that, you know, people are funding for all sorts of things, for fees, for maintenance, for conference costs. Lots of them say funding for everything. So you just, you know, if for whatever reason, um, you your funding stops or, you know, all sorts of things can happen, then you can pretty much fund for, for, for everything. You can You can just apply to fund everything. Um, so yeah, there are lots of, uh, success stories online. Um, you know, if you're interested in, in this method, then read through them. Um, and you can just, it makes it seem really tangible and easily achievable. Once you read that lots of people have been successful using this method. Um, just a kind of side note that I did write a success story on the website and they gave me a hundred pounds, which was pretty sweet. Um, just talking about the grants that I applied for and, and my kind of process of using, using the guide, um, over the summer between my undergraduate and masters just to raise, um, that money to, um, yeah, just to help me out financially so that I could, I could do my masters. So in summary, um, I know that was a whistle stop tour, but we can do some questions after if anyone um, needs more information. Uh, but charities and trusts are an underrated, but very useful funding resource. Um, there are lots that will consider sponsoring you. Um, and the guide itself provides pretty much all the help you need. It makes the process as easy as it can be. Um, in terms of writing your personal statement, your financial statement, success stories, like all, there's so much help. Um, it makes this very unusual method of applying to um, educational trusts and charities, which are very obscure and kind of um, unconventional funding. They just make it as easy as it can be. Uh, you just got to be a little bit creative. Um, I talked about crowdfunding as well, which can be a useful um, additional way of supplementing um, um, the money that you need for funding. And you just you just got to kind of put in the work. You just got to sit down and actually go through the process. But uh, it also looks great on your CV. And I did it and it wasn't really that difficult. And um, yeah, so can you. So, um, yeah, that's that's all I've got. Um, thanks for listening and I'm happy to take any questions if there are any. I always forget how weird it is to talk to like a blank screen on, on Zoom. Has Jordan, has Jordan gone? Yes, I did. Say again. That's a nice presentation by the wave so uh, so yeah it was nice but i have some questions to ask like since i did my i did my msc from bangor there it was back in 2019 and 2020 session and mm -hmm. unfortunately due to covid i have to return back home so may i know how red will help me to actually for a scholarship so that I can apply either for a PhD or maybe for a second master's. Um, you kind of cut out there. Can you just repeat um, the question? You're asking how, if Reed can help you apply for a PhD? Yes, how Reed can help me out to for a PhD, for a PhD on a certain topic. And secondly, how Reed can help me to get scholarship for, for a second master's program, if that makes sense, what I mean to say. Yeah, I mean, you could definitely just come and speak to any of us on the committee. We're all PhD students and we can try and find like um, a relevant person who might be able to help. I mean, I, applying for PhDs, lots of us are PhD students, so we can definitely help with that. But you said you're an international international student? I was an international student. It was uh, it was like five year, four or five years back. Okay, well, just that applying for PhDs as an international student is a slightly different process. So we would try and find someone who could help you with that, rather than applying as a domestic student. Yes. So and I think. Uh, uh, 
and I also I was a regular member of Red. So it saddens me that I was just part of a like the last time when I attended a Red session, it was very dated back in 2022, sometimes mm -hmm. in June or July. Then afterwards, uh, I was really irregular in, in, in the activities. So uh, there was Ruben, there was Busha who was there. So uh, hope, hope to get communicate with Red soon uh, and get get connected. Okay, great. But w feel free to reach out if you um if you need some more help with the with applying for PhDs or applying for scholarships. I'm sure we could try and find some resources or find um someone who can help you with that. Cheers, thanks. You're welcome. Thanks. Is anyone else? Yeah, hi. Hello. Hi, yeah, um, I'm Drithi. I have, um, I was saying, I'm actually about to embark on a master's. I was saying um, at UCL doing like a tech environment uh, master's, which I'm a little bit scared about. But I'm very lucky in that I've been able to get um, some funding already, some scholarship stuff. So I wanted to find out when you're, when you've already been able to get uh, partial funding, uh, like my challenge now is more the maintenance rather than the the scholar, the, the fees. Mm -hmm. These are not sweet for me. Are the fortunes more likely to favour you, or is it like Holden? She's already got some, so we're less likely to give her some more money, even though I definitely still have a deficit. Because I saw that you had was it four? So did you tell each of them, look, I've already got some funding, or how does that work out in terms of being transparent, but also knowing that it's never it's never going to be enough? Um. So the first thing is that grants, most of the trusts and charities, they like it if other charities and trusts have funded you. They like to support people that have already um, been successful in a certain amount of funding. So if you can, if you have a, a a shortfall in your maintenance and you can clearly specify where that shortfall is coming from and like how it's come about, then even though you've got funding for tuition, it's still obvious that you are at a financial deficit, um, hopefully due to reasons outside of your control. So the whole point is that this is this is unforeseen you know i couldn't help this but this is this is a financial barrier and it's um affecting my ability to complete my masters i mean the guide is helpful in so many different contexts that's why the stories are so useful is that everyone has a different story and has come to this need of financial aid um from a different different perspective right it's not like we all come for the same reasons so I think for you, if you have a shortfall and you can specify exactly where it comes from, you'll you you have a good chance of applying. Um and yeah, just being very specific and I'd say read through the stories. And there's a certain way of writing these applications that comes across and reads really well. I didn't have time to read a statement now, but if you read through some of the statements, you'll get an idea of what the style of writing is that works really well. Um does that sort of answer the question? Yeah, no, no, that's really helpful. As I said, it's that whole sort of, you've got some, but you've got to keep going and just being quite transparent about that element. So at the moment, I am I was freelancing, but my industry is collapsing. And so the freelancing has been really ad hoc. And I've been able to get like a Saturday job as a, as a weekend library assistant. So it's not like I'm not trying, but because yeah. I have to put the minimum employment I have anyway to a side, it, I know that there's definitely going to be that shortfall just even for it's a year, just, just being able to... Uh, to manage so that's really helpful thank you yeah and that will look really good as well if you mention that you're you're working or you're trying different things like you're not just trying to get money from from these people like you're trying other things that look that reads really well um they're, they're much more um likely to support those kind of things or you've tried other avenues so it sounds like for you it's not like you're trying to raise money for to start something it's like you've started something you're you're halfway or however long of the way through it, but now you've been hit by this financial barrier. There are lots of stories um, on their website of students that have encountered things like that, like their rent's gone up or for whatever reason, they've just been hit with this um, big financial stress, like halfway through studying and they're already working and they just need a little bit of money to help them finish. There are lots of sto um, success, success stories with that kind of um, framework, under that framework. Any other questions from anyone? Just 
have a look at the chat. Okay. Um, if, any, if no one has any more questions, does anyone have any more general questions about read or anything that they want to ask? If not, yeah, go ahead. I do. I Sorry, again, says me again, just because it's really neat. Like I was aware of read, but then um, because I'm now sort of in this switching life mode. Uh, is it, I just want to check, is this a free membership or is this a paid for membership? Or how do you actually go about being involved? Because I saw that it is part of the British Eco um, Ecological Society. So it'd be useful just to know the next step process. I did have a quick look at the, um, the link that was put into the chat. I just want to check, am I right in thinking you get, you can apply for free membership as a student for a year? Uh, but it's generally a paid membership. Is that is that right? With the BS. Uh, yes, yes, yeah. Yeah, yeah you, get, you get free membership as a student. Cool. And then Reed is part of the BS. It's not a separate entity. Like no, it falls under. Reed sits under. under the BS as a. Okay. Yeah. You can join by. Have you got all the relevant information? You you can just join. You don't have to pay for BS membership to be part of Reed. You can if you drop us an email. And then we just add you to our mailing list and that's how you become a member. You don't necessarily have to be part of the BS. But yeah, you still can join them through the free student membership as well. Brilliant. So does that mean I'm now a member because I've got i started getting the emails after I <laughs> yeah, tweeted you? Yeah. Perfect. Thank you so much. Thank you. Any other questions from anyone? If not, then I think we can wrap up there. All right, great. Really good session, Justin. Thanks, Rubes. Okay. Uh yeah, I'm gonna um yeah, thanks everyone for joining. Um and um stay tuned for the next skills seminar. But yeah, I'm gonna leave the call now, but uh enjoy the rest of your day, everyone. All right, bye. Bye, everyone. Thank you. That was so good. Bye.